This is episode 102 of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Well, I have to tell you, it's good to be back at podcasting again. And I apologize to listeners for leaving and being away for so long without giving you advance notice. The truth of the matter is, I wasn't expecting to be gone for as long as I was. Something just happened to me. I think I got busy. Life got in the way. It became difficult to podcast. And I just kind of hit a wall. I guess I needed the break. But thank you for your patience. And I hope you will continue listening. And thank you for those of you who sent me such nice emails expressing concern while I was out. I'm fine. I was always fine. Things are well. Just needed a break. Well, today's episode, you're going to like it. We're going to be speaking with Jeb B. from the Freethinkers Group in Denver, Colorado. We've spoken with Jeb before. He was a guest about a year and a half ago, I think, one of our early episodes. In that episode, you might remember that he was talking about difficulties that his group was experiencing with the Central Committee of Alcoholics Anonymous in Denver. They didn't want to list his meeting. Well, I say they. It was actually the manager of the central office there who didn't want to list their meetings. So I asked him to come back to give us an update on that situation. And that's what this podcast is about. Without further ado, Jeb B. Hello, Jeb. How you doing? Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. It's wonderful and a great privilege to talk with you again after these, I guess it's a a year or two since the last talk. I don't know. Yeah, it's been over a year. It's hard to believe. I had you on one of our early podcasts. You know, I have to say that We've had people come to our group because of that podcast. Is that right? A guy now who had heard heard my podcast, so that's why he came to to Freethinkers, and it's been a great, you know, that's a great reward of getting the, the message out there. What I liked about that conversation that we had is um, we were talking about the whole process that you go through, you know, um, the process of the steps, basically. People love that. They they love to hear from somebody who's who's secular and how they approach the program. And so that was pretty popular. So this will be a nice way to catch up. And today we're going to be talking more about your group, Freethinkers in AA, located in Denver, Colorado. So I know you've been having some problems. Um, the last time that you and I spoke, actually, and this will, the, to show you how long this has been going on, um, you were mentioning at that time that the Denver Central Committee of Alcoholics Anonymous wouldn't list your group. And I remember the reason that they gave you was that they did not want a newcomer's first impression of AA to be the Denver Freethinkers and AA group. That's basically discrimination. The problem in that is that we're they. You know, all this plural use in AA is dangerous. And the truth is, it was the office manager of, of the central office who made that decision. And unfortunately, that's but dominated because some years ago they made a decision, whoever they were, <laughs> that she had the authority to make decisions on listings or delistings. And, you know, I guess that was just it. But the big change that's taken place in the last couple of months is she has retired and there's a new uh, central office manager. I have this person but uh, we have a new delegate that we're sending, even though we're not recognized and don't have a vote there, for whatever reasons, who hopes that it by maybe in one year we'll be listed again. I don't, or not again, we never have been. Our first meeting was October 4th of 2013, and it started with four or five people that had been together and said we need to start offering something for non-religious people who feel turned away or turned off by those other AA meetings. And uh, that we, we started with every other week initially. And so our initial application or for registration or whatever for listing, the excuse that was given by this office manager was that we can't list uh, every other week. We only list monthly, we, uh, uh, weekly meetings. And then uh, the, that we were going to call ourselves Secular AA, and she said, you can't uh, name yourself after the location. We were meeting in a place called the Secular Hub, 
And rather than argue with her, I said, well, Joe, what other ideas do you have? And she said, well, some groups call themselves free thinkers. Some call themselves we agnostics, we are atheists and agnostics. And I said, well, free thinkers sounds good. So that's when we submitted our registration to GSO and got started and started making our first contributions to the service structure, elected a, uh, G, a, a GSR, became active in the district and er, attending area assemblies and so forth. So that was back in 2013 that we did, we went through that and it wasn't until, oh, I guess maybe a couple of years later, we submitted another application and we were told that we couldn't be listed and because we didn't meet the criteria that they post on their website. The interesting thing is I have always seen that we have understood that we meet the criteria, but Yes, but the, den, the current delegates to the central office committee, or what do they call it, Denver area, <laughs> Denver area central committee of Alcoholics Anonymous, don't have any of this history. And you know, as my experience is, generally people who end up as intergroup reps or whatever are people with not too much experience with with AA, the traditions, the concepts the structure of AA, the history of AA, and therefore they just go along with, with whatever. Um, so it was last December we decided to write them one more time, and everything went to the office of the of the the area committee. And so we didn't, you know, we didn't have any direct contact with the chairperson of that or any of the elected officers. Everything went through the the uh, manager. They then responded and scheduled us to to appear at the January meeting of this year to present our our case, as it were. They sent me that that in the afternoon of that meeting, so there was no way to prepare to have other people besides me attend that meeting. So tell me, Jeb, do other AA groups have to present a case before intergroup before uh, they're listed on their on the website? Well, that's one of the questions we've asked them, and we could not get an answer. See, what happened then is I wrote back and said, since we weren't able to attend that with the short notice, uh, I hope we can come in, in in February, which we did. Four other members of our group, including a couple of officers, attended the February meeting of this central committee, and... Uh, I will say it was, they gave us the majority of the meeting time. It was a very interesting meeting, probably 50 or 60 people there. I, I don't know how many groups there are in Denver area, but it, it was very good. But a lot of the questions were very good and I fielded questions for probably 45 minutes to the best of my ability. What kind of questions did you get? Well, they, they, said that, well, you know, one of our concerns is that you, it appears that you, uh, you, you, you are affiliated, you have an outside affiliation, which is one of the, the, the things that stated in there said, no, we really don't. Any more than any other group, renting space from a church has an affiliation there. And, uh, and they did, well, what about this international, what about, you know, secular AA? And I said, well, that's, you know, as I understand it, that's the same as young people in AA or doctors in AA or lawyers in AA. It's a part of the, a network for, you know, for, for support and, and, and learning. And, you know, I don't know how that was accepted by people. Then they started checking our website. Oh, they, and, and one, the officer, the office manager chimed up and says, well, they have their own website. And I said, well, let me tell you the history. Since we were refused listing locally, and our purpose, primary purpose, is to keep the doors of AA open to anyone and everyone, regardless of what they believe. The only thing is requirement for a membership is a desire to stop drinking. Therefore, we we paid for listing as a meetup group. And people that got us on Google searches of anyone looking for secular, atheist, skeptical, non, you know, humanistic AA 
could find an AA meeting where they would be welcome. Then that, 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 that helped a lot. And then we immediately started a website so that people could also find, if they do a Google or other search, they can find secular or non-religious AA in, uh, in the Denver area. Sure. And, you know, a lot of groups have websites. Are there other groups in Denver that have their own website? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I learned very early when I moved here in, in 2005 that Denver is a is very parochial, very reg, regional. They're very suspicious of anyone from outside. It's like a closed system, and they don't look beyond and this is politically speaking now, they don't look beyond what's happening in the, in Colorado. And I just have to accept that. So, you know, our, our whole point, well, well, the thing that I kept saying throughout that meeting is you have to understand this is not about Jeff Barrett. It's not about free thinkers in AA. It's about the alcoholic who still suffers. And our primary purpose is stated in the Declaration of Responsibility. That's who we are. And if nobody else is going to do that, then we, we need to do what we can. No, we can't. However, it would be really wonderful if people, in calling the hotline and asked about secular meetings, they would be told something other than, well, there's no such thing. All AA is, you know, is about God. Or they'd be told, well, I guess you need to drink if you have, if you can't take and, you know, that, that upsets me. And I told him, I also shared the fact that my partner committed suicide now 34 years ago. Part of what the people had told him, if you don't get God, you're going to die. I've heard that hundreds of times in my 40 years, almost 40 years of sobriety that, and, and that, that just makes my heart, that it makes my heart really bleed. So, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about you know, being here for those people, I've known, you know, I've been in, you know, I've been sober for about 40 years, and I've, I've known probably at least around 200 people who have committed suicide in AA. And I can't say this is all because they didn't get the God idea or they couldn't take someone else's concept of what a higher power is or if they didn't do anything. But, you know, and that sounds extravagant, but you realize that's only five a year. And I think a lot of us who've been around for a while can think of five people they've known at some level who have come in and then just caught away and very soon they're, you know, we know that they're dead. So, you know, that's one of my great passions is suicide prevention because of my own experience. And most alcoholics I know have even have thought about it in some way. And I know when I came in, people, I heard people talking about uh, the fact that there were, you know, there, Drinking was like slow suicide. Yeah. And not, you know, not recovering from that, all of that discomfort, disease, whatever you want to call it, does people to taking one way out or another. So, <laughs> uh, we, you know, they did not take a vote. Well, they, oh, they also, uh, we were criticized for, uh, for, since then, for having the banner from the Austin Convention posted on our website. On the home page, you know, uh, uh, only human power can relieve our alcohol. <laughs> you find us now. Hey, that's what Bill found out. And that's what the book really says. But right. why should I assume that anybody has read the book, let alone tried to do anything about with the 12 steps? Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> I have to give it out. But I, you know, I kept saying, well, they did not take a vote at that at that meeting, and I thought that was great. These people are going to go back to their groups. They're going to think about it. maybe they'll visit the website, maybe they'll visit our group, and maybe they'll do some research. And I will say that a, a number of GSRs or no delegates at central office and GSRs had visited our group, and they had positive things to say. Our DCM uh, had visited our group and was very very supportive, and. However, early on, I must say that the manager sent a couple people as spies to our group to see if we were doing things right. Now, I have no idea if that was her common um, you know, mode of operation, that she always had someone go to new groups to see if they were doing things <laughs> in an orthodox manner. 
So what is your meeting like? What is, what, what's your format? What's a typical meeting like at, at, at Freethinkers and AA? Well, the whole thing is, is about inclusiveness. You know, we do, we do a, a normal welcome and tell them about coffee and that sort of thing, but we, we, we have this phrase, as a registered group in Alcoholics Anonymous, we are committed to helping others accept and practice the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in an accepted, accepting and supportive fellowship with honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. That's not like we're quoting the big book. You know, <laughs> and then we have, we have, uh, asked somebody to read the agnostic and free thinkers preamble uh, to which, uh, we've added the, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. I think that's important. And then we, uh, we do, we do the chip business and recognizing people's sobriety. We get people a, Newcomers, a 10 minute chip, because we don't, it was early decided we don't want to use chip, chips, medallions, tokens that have the, the GOD word on the back. The square. So we had to look for something uh, other than that. And, and, and then we, um, after the, that piece, we ask if there's anyone, their first, first, uh, meeting at, at Freethinkers. We give them a newcomer packet. Which includes a lot of helpful things, including our, our, our little pamphlet that's, in addition to secular 12 steps, it has some uh, questions and answers. One of them is, do people, do members, uh, practice the 12 steps? And the answer is basically, some do and some don't. That's the true of any AA meeting as far as, and then with the, after the birthday interruption, we always go around and have everybody introduce themselves, gives them a, a chance to hear themselves say, my name is Jeb and I'm an alcoholic or whatever they want to say. We have one fellow who says, my name is such and such and I don't drink. <laughs> I love it because, uh, well, it is uh, just accepting. And then we, we do a reading of the 12 steps with an introduction to the, our secular 12 steps based on the, the literature. So you read a secular version of the steps? Absolutely, always. Oh, oh interesting. Do they does do they give you a hard time over that? Well, Joe did. Uh, you know that the, the manager she said, well, and they use use their own twelve steps. And my response to that was, well, what some of us has learned is that is really what they said they did. I my, my first A meeting. I thought when they read that introduction to twelve to uh, introduction to how it works, the people in that room had done or were doing those things. <laughs> no time for me to realize that I had to adopt them for myself, and this is it, you know. So, also the book itself doesn't say we admitted we were powerless earlier on. He says we had to concede to our innermost selves that we were powerless over alcohol. So that means I had to concede. That's where. I made the contact, and that's where other people make contact with that inner, what the great reality deep within, and those and other things. So the steps really in 2014 there was a we had a version, a very simple version of the secular 12 steps that we worked with, and then listening to other people, we finally expanded them to what is posted on our website, and it's very practical. That's what. The piece that I, was so important to me is that Bill refers in the book to precise directions and no way is 12 sentences or, you know, statements precise directions. So it meant to me that our steps from my steps my and, and, and ours need to reflect the process basically described on pages 63 through 88 or through the next chapter if we want to include more. And they seem to be working for those who work them. Now, you know, I, I did a workshop at the Austin conference two years ago, and that workshop was, was on uh, spirituality minus religion, no more pretending, because that's what I think AA has done for me. It helped, I, it helped me let go of old ideas so that I could let go of my, my archaic and toxic belief that something outside of myself imagined or real was going to take care of me or do any of this shit. And, you know, Bill, really, if I read carefully in everything, it shows that the action, and that's why he used the word steps, 
a course of action. This course of action is what made the difference in his life. And in, in, in beginning was, was finding somebody else who had the same kind of background and thoughts and, and hopes of getting past the drinking and, and other, other things. Did anybody from the area or your district speak in your defense? Yes, there were. In fact, our, I, I guess it was the secretary from the area was there at that meeting and he didn't say very much other than he hoped, you know, that you know, this is something that needs to be carefully considered. I, w- I want to jump ahead quickly to the minutes of the next meeting where I thought we didn't attend that, although we were told that we could send somebody to be present there, but not as a delegate. We didn't do that for another month. They want, Will they not allow you to be represented as a delegate at the intergroup? Absolutely not. No. They not have a voice, not have a vote. So the minutes of the following meeting said that they that the decision was made that we did not meet the criteria. However, there was nothing in the minutes or whatever they call that, that indicated they'd taken any kind of a vote, group conscience or whatever you want to call it. And so my guess is that Joe made the decision, again, that we can't list them because they don't meet the criteria. Interesting. Now, you know, <laughs> here's the thing that just frustrates me is you, you um, are registered with the General Service Office and you are active in the district. You are an AA group. And, you know, every AA group, they say in Kansas City anyway, when they listed us, they said every group has a right to be wrong and that you're an AA group as soon as you say you are. And even Bill Wilson said, you can you can believe anything, say you can even be anti-AA and still call yourself an AA group. So there's really nothing that when they say you don't meet the criteria, there really isn't any criteria to meet. Now, I guess the pamphlet, the um, AA group does say just pro- that an AA group is just any two alcoholics getting together, provided they have no other outside affiliation. And, and you don't have that. And there were some people who, who quoted those things at that meeting, and not our members, but others. But you know, the problem is, the majority of people know nothing about the history of the formation of the, the traditions and, and, and the guidelines and so forth for, for groups. And, you know, and, you know, they know nothing about what an informed group conscience is even. And you, and you, as you know, every, uh, meeting at every level, there are always new people who come in there to- totally green and they kind of just listen to the old timers, you know, and the way that they've, perhaps dominated things. So from from my perspective, this looks to me like it's just out and out discrimination. And it, and it reminds me actually of the situation in Toronto. Is anybody there in Denver uh, familiar with what happened in Toronto? Yes. I've talked a bit about it and I've shared some of the correspondence, some of the outcome. I also shared that with, with Denver Central Office. I don't know if it ever went beyond the manager though, what happened in Toronto. Have you has your group thought about taking any kind of action like Larry K did in um, Toronto? I mean, we don't have anything like the Human Rights um, Tribunal, but is there anything that we can do in the United States that when our civil rights are being violated like that? Well, you know, I back the reason there was such a gap between 2013 or 14 and up to 2016 is I have. I try to live this program the best of my ability, and one of the things, just cease fighting anybody or anything, you know, even alcohol, but even the manager or central office, you know, any of those things. So I was not going to get into a pissing match with that woman. My feeling is it's going to have to wait until she dies or she retires. So I am hopeful with the new manager and new officers, I guess, that things will change. We have a, 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 a new person who's volunteered to, to attend central office meetings. She will have 40 years of sobriety in December. She's very bright. She's very sensitive and she's hoping to get to know the, the new manager, the officer and, and see if we can't do something about getting the listing. We have requested and I talked with, is it Beth H., uh, who's doing the, uh, who is it that's doing the survey of uh, all of the uh, intergroup listings around the country? 
Well, anyway. Uh, Deidre? No, no, no. It's somebody else who's doing a workshop, actually. In, oh. In, oh. Oh, I don't uh, know. Oh, and it's, it's wonderful. And by the way, one of the things that we wanted is that there be a filter on the website to, to, you know, for people to enter looking for secular, because they've got young people's meetings, they've got closed meetings over here, at LGBTQ, WXYZ meetings, men's meetings, women's meetings. Let's put a listing for secular on there. They won't do that in Kansas City. I remember, you know, they gave us, they didn't, they didn't give us a hard time when they listed our group. The, they, there was some debate, but they finally concluded that every group has a right to be wrong. So they listed us. We did ask in a very informal way if they would give us the secular um, AA designation or an agnostic atheist designation. And the person who at that time was the president of the board of central office says it wasn't a good time to even ask about that. And, and we have never gone back to ask that, but um, I was on the board of the central office for a little bit, and I found the people there to be very, very religious. Um, and um, it was, I, I, you know, I was not comfortable there. In fact, I'm, I, I don't even talk to the people at my central office anymore. I had a falling out with them. So I understand. But, you know, the thing is, you have your own website, you're listed on the Secular AA website, and the fact of the matter is, when people are looking for a Secular AA meeting, what they do is they Google Secular AA, or they Google AA for Freethinkers, or AA for Atheists, or whatever, and that's when they find your website, or they find your listing on Secular AA. They're never right. going to find you on the on this, you know, the Kansas City Central Office website if they don't even know you're a secular group. Going back many years, when I was in where Missoula, Montana, I guess it was in Missoula. They they were the starting of an LGB. I don't I don't know if they called it LGBTQ. I there was that narrow definition. Uh, there were controversies with with the district and the central office or intergroup there about listing those meetings and also having a you know a, a, a you know a, a category for that. And it, it took some time. But How long ago was that, uh, Jeff? Oh, that's 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was just reading Deirdre's talk from Austin where she was talking about the history of um, special interest groups. Huh? And, I, and I actually read a book, too, about the history of um, gays and, and AA. And people forget, but the uh, gay groups really had a hard time in the beginning. They did, they, there were, the, the, a lot of inter, intergroups did not want to list them. And... They, this started in the 70s, but then in the 80s, when the country started um, experiencing some religious fervor or whatever, it got worse again, and they, and they were really um, discriminated against. Yeah. Now that, that's <laughs> what is But uh, I'm just trying to where we went. But we did, did the, I guess, the one of the, the, reason, the things that we managed to do in Missoula, and then when I, after I moved to Spokane, I thought they were already doing it. That the when people called the hotline, they had a list of people who were willing to respond to the the LGBT whatever uh, call callers, and that you know that is what I would like to see for secular AA come you know here in well for the AA hotline in the Denver area because I was at uh, I my the my old home group here in Aurora has a night watch where they take phones and it's a party sort of thing, you know, covered, you know, potluck sort of thing. And I knew the woman who was in charge of that hotline, uh, what the night watch sort of thing. And she took a call from, some, from someone that late, got, later got back to me asking about non-religious AA meetings. And of course, this woman says, well, they're, they're not religious. They're secular. And and when the conversation went on, and she said, well, are there any non-prayer, non-religious meetings? And this woman who knows me well and knew about our meetings, because we had flyers at at this Buckeye Easy, well, the Southeast Aurora Club here, and and she said, no, there are such no such meetings, <laughs> and that you no, know, that should not happen when you call. You only contact, if people look for AA Denver, they're going to go to their website, they're going to find the hotline number there, but they're not going to find that. Also, if you go to Area 10, which is the Colorado area, and you, you're, you're meeting things, the link on there is for the three central offices in Colorado that takes you directly to their websites, and for ours, of course, 
you're going to find that there's no non-religious AA. Now, I know that in many, from this talk that I had last week, there, and I've done some checking of, of websites also, that there are many that will list, you know, we agnostics or unbelief or th those sort of things, but they don't have the filter for people who look for a non-religious or a secular meeting. They don't, but more and more are getting it all the time. Yeah, well, I, you know, and I don't know what's, other than education, I don't know how we're going to open the hearts and minds and whatever it is of, of other people to see that there is a need there. And some people just cannot stand uh, the, the kind of, well, what the bill actually calls in the big book, magical thinking. Or spiritual make believe, I guess that you know many of us, you know many, some of us live in spiritual make believe until we saw the childishness of it. I have no idea what he was actually talking about there, but I do know that it becomes an impediment for increasingly more people, and not just young people. But the wonderful thing for me at the beginning is after the word got out that we did have a non-religious meeting that is without prayer and that sort of thing and all the God talk. We had people come in back to our meeting who hadn't been to a meeting for eight or ten, twelve years, and had years of sobriety. But they brought in some wonderful experience of applying the process of this, you know, of the action, the twelve steps of their lives, and and they become regulars and doing things. We now have, I you know, our home group members for service and recoveries is forty five or fifty people. Ah. And that, that's considerable. We have two meetings. We added a second meeting after the first year on Saturday, which at the beginning was maybe three people or four people. And suddenly it's larger than our Monday night meeting. Wow. Isn't that great? And, and I thought, well, be, the people have been asking, can't we really need more than one meeting a week? I thought it would be the same people from the Monday night would start coming to the, uh, Saturday meeting. But, yeah, oh, half a dozen, or maybe or four or five of them attend both. I mean, I go to both of them all the time, and I have for what we'll celebrate five years in October this year. Fantastic. And that's an accomplishment. Now, not everybody has stayed around. Uh -huh. And one of the things right now that I think newer people to the group, and those who have had long-term sobriety, have to learn something about being more flexible and sensitive to other people coming in and not not cutting them off when they're speaking or you know contradicting them but it, it is it's really a wonderful meeting the result is i seldom ever go to what a regular aa meeting oh i don't either anymore i i haven't in a long time actually you know, starting an AA group is really interesting. I, I've, it's, a, it's an experience that I'm, I'm so grateful that I've had. But it's AA groups are interesting in themselves because, um, as you say, not everybody sticks around, right? So, like, I've seen, I've seen our group go through like different personalities. Almost the group has evolved. You know, as as a, as one group of people comes in, and a, and a certain group of people start chairing meetings and stuff. Like when when I first started the group, you would look around. And it was a great group and everything, but there was mostly people my age or older, right? Well, then a couple of years ago, we started, I think the first year I was like leading the meetings all the time, me and maybe a couple other people. Well, now we just, we turn it over to the group to lead the meetings. And we have a lot of younger people chairing the meetings now. And they do it in their own style. They do their own thing, not the way that I was doing it. And now you, now I look around and most of the people in the room are younger than me. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. So it's funny how the group can change you like that, you know? Yeah, and I and I like that, and I like to kind of sit back and watch. But I also learned that I need to let people do it their way. And you know, the like the other day I was well, I I and I don't I haven't been going to that many meetings lately. But the other day I left a meeting and I was watching everybody outside gathering and the patio, some of them smoking and talking, and I and I thought to myself, that's what's keeping them. That's what's helping them. That's more important probably than what was happening inside that meeting room is that they all have that connection. Now, it is the fellowship that that Bill found with Bob and others found in those original fifty or sixty people that, that encouraged them to keep move keep moving forward, uh, <laughs> and that's the human power. 
you know, on our, on our own. I couldn't have done it. You know, I was a religious fanatic be- before I came to AA. And some people can't stand to hear that, but it's the reality. And, you know, I'd say that AA, because of the spiritual program of action that Bill refers to the step, you know, helped to make me, first of all, I was a pretty much agnostic, but then I became atheistic. And now I'm, you know, I'm really, uh, well, an anti-theism uh, humanist. Huh. What does that mean? <laughs> I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous to be expecting something invisible and imaginary from from, from the Bronze Age or the, or the Iron Age, either <laughs> one, is going to do a damn thing for me. It has been my experience. But that is my experience. Right. And that, you know, my, my whole thing is that, you know, working with others has a lot of good stuff in it. One of the things that I got is that I need to quit hiding behind the big book and tell how it works for me. And that's, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, I'll be doing another workshop at, at, at Toronto. It's now called, um, what is it called? Well, the subtitle is a 12 step che- checklist. That's where this group has been so helpful to me. All of my, most of my sobriety, I've looked at that, uh, the tradition checklist, and I've seen that that, it's all I statements. What am I doing for the group? How am I relating to the group? How am I supporting it? And so I'll be seeing you in Toronto pretty soon. When, when are you, when are you coming into town? Uh, early that morning, I'm taking a red eye. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Early Friday actually... morning. Okay, and, so I'll be in Toronto on Wednesday. Oh, will you? Oh. Uh-huh. And it's yeah, all through the weekend. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some time for one-on-one sort of sharing yeah. and so forth there because, you know, what you're doing is such a tremendous value to the secular alcoholic, you know, out there and inside a, and, uh, you know, your, your work and the, and the stuff that, that, that uh, Roger's doing in Toronto with his publications and, and Joe and, you know, there's so many, and the new guy down in, uh, in, in, uh, hmm, Australia, Justin. Oh yeah. With his podcast and so forth. Wow. You know, amazing. And, you know, people hearing, well, I had no idea you could, you could look at it that way and still be a card carrying AA member. And yeah, and, and that's it, you know? And it's funny, it is a good way to get to get the message out too. you know, um, there's actually a couple of people in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which is in the southern southeastern part of the state, Mm -hmm. um, who listen to our podcast. And um, they particularly liked that when we were going through the steps, and they're now inspired to start a secular meeting in Cape Girardeau. I'm so excited about that. That's great. And we have a guy, there's a guy who's come to our meeting in uh, Denver a couple of times. He was here a couple of years ago. And he was there again, oh, here again last week from Madison, Wisconsin. And he, oh, that's right. You get Robert. Robert. He, he said, you know, we, you know, thanks to your website, we got all of the stuff, a lot of the stuff we need to get a meeting going in Madison. And now there are three secular meetings or groups in Madison. Huh. That's right. They got most of their information to their, for their meeting from the Freethinkers and AA Denver website. Yeah, As we, yep. and and I try to keep that updated, and I think I, we posted now the uh, the the twelve step checklist, which I'll tell you because it was a, a lot of people. We we did a little group. It was nine people, twelve people signed up. That was going to be the limit to be a little closed group to work on this idea of uh, practicing the twelve steps on a daily basis, so that we and those around us can find emotional sobriety. That's quoting. Uh, you know, the, the 12 and 12. And my thing was the, we had the, tr- the traditions tr- checklist, uh, checklist, and I don't know how many people have actually used that and, or even recognized that it's all I statement. It's for personal inventory. It's not for groups to do, even though I've, I've tried to see, uh, tried in groups. How about measuring our progress as Bill Watt talks about in the sixth step of the 12 and 12? Where only in the, only the first step can be, can be, I promise, <laughs> can be practiced with perfection. The remaining 11 steps are perfect ideals, goal, goal, goal posts or something like that against to measure our progress. Well, I've been trying to do that for years, but I didn't have the right questions to ask myself. So this little group of nine people 
and, and we, we meeting for a couple months helped to put that sort of thing together. And it was, well, it was what I needed, but guess what? I can't do this shit alone. And I don't have to because other people have experience and insights and they keep teaching me. So, you know, that, I mean, that, so that's going to be basis of, of my, uh, my workshop. I look forward to that. Yeah. I'm putting together, a, 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 I will, you know, I will have the handouts of the tradi- traditions 12, uh, uh, checklist and the, the secular 12 step. Well, it, well, <laughs> the, the steps checklist, because one of the things after we did it with, with our secular version, I added be- above each one of the, the big book pages 59 and 60 versions so that people, you know, it, can see that there, it's, that's what it's all about. And, and the questions that I ask myself apply regardless of how you're trying to interpret or word the steps. So it's, you know, how, you know, I never thought I'd keep growing, but I keep learning. And that's, that's it. This afternoon, where our district is putting on the second time a day in AA with meetings, 10 meetings and three meals and all that sort of thing. And we are doing a, uh, and, and different groups from the, from the, uh, the district are, are using their formats or some version of their formats for leading meetings. They did it last year, or we did it last year, and we're doing it again this year. Uh, our meeting is at, is at three o'clock, and I'm, yeah, uh, uh we'll read, I think, a, a reading from Beyond Belief, which we read at most of our meetings. Uh, the first Saturday and first Monday of the, of the month, we read from uh, a chapter from Living Sober, which I had never paid much attention to in my early mm-hmm. sobriety. But when I realized that the, the book was there for people like the people, <laughs> those who are coming to our uh, our group now, yeah, we find it really valuable. And you know, most people don't realize that you can download all of the chapters from that book, you know, free. You don't have to buy the book, and the book is only five bucks. At least that's what we sell it for. We also sell it beyond belief for fifteen rather than eighteen or whatever it costs us because we think it's we we hear from everyone who uses it. These are things that help me to really get grounded and you know and hopeful and uh, you know and wonderful resources. I also this afternoon will have copies of uh, the the uh, article from the the AA website on concerning uh, conference approved. Literature, which makes it clear, you know, that that, that that's what what co- conference approved me- means, and recognizes that there's a lot of other things out there that are helpful to the recovering alcoholic. I have got to go out to Denver one of these days. You know, it's it's all I have to do is drive across Kansas and then halfway across Colorado, oh. and I'm there. <laughs> well, I keep saying I need to go south from here a little bit. <laughs> the south I've ever been is the Santa Fe a few years ago with my sister, and you know, I just don't do that sort of thing. But uh, your group yeah. just sounds really, uh, you know, vibrant, you know, and you're so into the it, it's so funny because, you know, these people that won't list your meeting and everything, you're really into AA, you're, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, gosh, but you're not going to do anything like, you know, you're not going to go to the press, you're not going to file a lawsuit or anything like that. You're just kind of going to wait them out because you're I guess you're doing OK, your group's doing OK. Yeah. It might hurt a little, but I guess is that your basic plan of action yeah to sit back you know be patient and what one of the things that i learned well uh, i don't know i probably was only about five four or five years sober is nothing is permanent we what we say is this too shall pass i can't get all head up about the fact that they're they're resisting us or they're judging us or they don't understand that you know one of my big concerns i hope comes across here is the, that those aren't calls to hotlines, how are they handled? And that just really, you know, breaks my heart that people are told, well, then I guess you have to go, you might as well go get drunk. And that, I've heard that more than once from people finally found us and said, you know, I'm so dismayed about AA, I will never go to one of those other meetings again because of what happened or, or I will never call that number. And I don't want, that's bad for AA. 
you know, people listening to this podcast, the, you know, hopefully someone might find us that has been told that, and now they can find out there is a secular path in AA. Um, right. You can absolutely do this from a secular action oriented approach. So, well, and, you know, what Deidre did in, 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 in developing the list of, of secular meetings, and now it's taken over by secular AA, uh, whatever, yeah, secular AA dot org, I guess it's on their website. That's amazing because it, that helped people to find, find us now, you know, and, and that's so important. But, uh, I guess you know, that last thing I, I, I really wanted to say is that our group is going to growth pains. And, you know, I'll have to admit that the first several years, I was very frustrated that other people would not take up responsibility and stick with them to keep things going, whether it's as secretary or treasurer or intergroup rep, or, you know, or, or GSR and so forth. And so my sponsor had always said the real significance of the 12th tradition is that it doesn't matter who does the job as long as the job gets done. In that taking the ego out of those, you know, officer trusted servant positions. So, I've ended up handling and well, many some people would say controlling what had what had to be done, and but <laughs> it finally brought to a point that at a we had a uh, business meeting a couple months ago where I took all of the concerns that people had brought up and put them in the form of motions for uh, to for, to get a second and discussion and a vote, and they were all designed to try to push the responsibility onto others. I went to a steering committee and so forth. And what had been happening was a couple people, one of them fairly new to the group with long-term sobriety, says, you're just trying to control too much. You're just taking, you need to back off. You need to back off. And, you know, I have thick skin. And and I was glad to hear, so I was glad to hear those things. So what you want to do. And that was basically what, what was what well, one of the motions was was for a steering committee to 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 make some decisions about the the group uh the future of the group and so forth and uh so they're working on that there's a lot of change taking place as people taking responsibility i'm no longer opening up every monday and 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 saturday i'm i i'm continuing i said i will continue as the treasurer, but not as secretary, and for a time as the, the principal contact with the the, the landlord. Uh, but I want to see the things transition and moved on to other people. We've set up a, a Google Drive thing for uh, for free thinkers uh, on the, so that the officers and others that somebody decides can access the files and update things and so forth. So that more and more is coming off of my Dropbox where I store things and that other people could be taking responsibility. But this is a slow process. And I just want to, you know, I want to be supportive. Uh, I said, I'm, you know, I'm not going to leave just because things are changing, but these are the things I'm going to do. But one of the things that I did for them is, as I, uh, I did a full page of, re- of things that that I have been doing that need to be continue. And I was embarrassed in by the number of things that I was doing. I'm down to the point now where my major concern, other than keeping things up to date, is re- doing something as far as outreach to people who haven't been at a meeting for a while or to newcomers. You know, I've been, to the best of my ability, been texting or email and saying, I haven't missed you or, or I've missed you seeing you or I, I hope you're doing well or I'm you know, welcoming to the group and hope to see you next week. But I shouldn't be the only one doing that. And so that's, that's for the health of the group. I'm hoping we can, you know, we can, we can do something with, but, uh, I'm optimistic. Used to drive my parents crazy. That was the eternal <laughs> optimism. <laughs> But it's really based, it's based on what what we can do. You know, that the fifth column of my inventory is always what could, what could I have done instead? And then it becomes what can I do in those situations today? One of them is, you know, one of them, as Madeline Albright says, see something, say something, do something. And that's what's often missing is let's do something. So that's what I do. 
that I do, and that's probably why you do what you do. Well, I don't know, but you're fantastic. Um, look forward to seeing you in Toronto, um, I guess, next week. Yep. Yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to it. And uh, you're such a good man and a, a, good, a good witness for what AA can be. Oh, you too. All right, Jed, nice talking to you again. You, uh, you have a good day now. You too. Thanks so much. Well, that concludes another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. You all be well, take care, and I'll talk to you again real soon.